Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, joined here on set with criminal defense attorney Michael Bachner. We also have with us Cheryl Dorsey. Bunch of things we're covering right now. Let's get started. That was some great reporting by Aaron there, Michael. And really, that split. What do you make of that? I mean, they, it's a complicated case with multiple counts, multiple stories, multiple events, but yet the jury seemed to consider each one very carefully. What do you make of the, the way that the outcome was of the first trial? Well, jurors are told when they deliberate, and defense lawyers often remind them that they're supposed to look at every, every offense separately, every alleged victim differently, and not to uh, basically throw in the whole case through this pattern type of conduct. Well, he did one, he must have done the others. So uh, the juror obviously took it very, very seriously. They know that the, the uh, evidence is very, very significant, but the charge is very serious. And they looked and said, hey, you know, we found credibility in one and not in others. And we, if, by looking at each one individually as compared to in a group, uh, they were able to uh, discern differences that convinced them that there wasn't proof beyond a reasonable doubt, some as to others. And look, I think that's part of the remarkable part of our jury system, that people called in who are, you don't know from the day you've met them, that day you're sitting in front of them, and they know their job is serious. And, and they, they, do, they, they really do oftentimes, uh, defense lawyers like the same, prosecutors too, that Sometimes individual jurors may not be the smartest people in the world individually, but for some reason, as a group, they become really, really smart. No, I was very impressed with this jury, how they came to a consideration, a very careful consideration with each of the counts. Again, you had a situation where they might have said, oh, we found him guilty of one of these things related to one of these Jane Doe's. We should maybe find him guilty across the board of that, but they didn't. They carefully considered each one of the facts. Now, I'm also here with retired LAPD Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey. Cheryl, the idea that the jury was able to come to a decision maybe as to the lewd conduct uh, for Jane Doe number five with the equipment room, not guilty as to the jacuzzi incident. Uh, they find him guilty of the forcible rape of, one, of a homeless woman. What did you make of the split there? Was it that the jury needed sometimes more evidence than just the uh, recount of one of the victims they needed, for example, as Aaron said in his report, that the evidence showed he was at a specific time, at a specific place, and then you back that up with the testimony of the witnesses. I mean, we all like as much evidence as possible. Sometimes we have that, sometimes we don't. And in these kinds of sexual assault or misconduct cases, you tell me, is it, as an, from an investigative standpoint, it might be difficult sometimes to find that extra evidence. Um, and maybe that's what happened here. What do you think? Well, I'm just thinking in terms of the um, not being able to prove the whether or not he was masturbating in the jacuzzi. All of us have probably been in one at one time and, and, and would think it's reasonable to say, I don't really know what's going on underneath the bubbles. And so they wanted to be fair. But again, remember that uh, they were favored in the direction of guilt with regards to the sodomy of the young woman who um, he had been involved in a relationship with or had consensual sex with in 2003. 10 to 2, they were in favor of guilty. And so was it that they just tired of trying to bring those other two over? The same thing with Jane Doe number one, in favor of guilt, 7 to 5, with regards to the rape and oral cop. Did they get tired of trying to bring those other um, over to the guilty side and, and just thought, let's just go with what we can all agree on quickly so, so we could be done? I don't know. Now, if we do have time, I want to see if we can play this. I want to go to Dan Owens, who was actually the prosecutor in this case. He um, he discussed the verdict uh, afterwards. He held a press conference. If we have that, let's play it right now. And we'll talk about it on the other side. Michael, I want to get your perspective on this. On every one of the hung counts, the jury favored guilt. If you look at the breakdowns, and we might have that graphic up, you could see that there were a couple of holdouts on one, maybe a few holdouts on another, but it was always favoring guilt. Now, we just heard that point about where they said that it was good that they tried all of these incidents together. Do you think that was a good move by the state? I mean, again, they didn't get the majority of the convictions that they wanted. So is there, it, does it make sense to try all of these counts together, or would it have been better? I know there's more time and expense with separating the trials. However, uh, what is your thought on that? From a prosecution's perspective, there's no doubt it's better trying them together because the jury sees where there's smoke, there's fire, and uh, right. their view of the world is, you, know, you can't help but be prejudiced, the prosecution hopes, even though they say they don't, uh, that they're going to be influenced and prejudiced by the fact that there are more than one victim. If this case was tried separately, um, it's not likely, although it's possible, we can see in the Cosby case, for example, where Bill Cosby, where the judge permitted uncharged criminal conduct. 
to be brought into trial. So even if they were tried separately, the theory would have been, well, Judge, we would try and admit this evidence as pattern conduct anyway. Might as well try it all together. Um, but, uh, and look, I think this prosecutor uh, in his statement at the end was highly professional um, and appropriate in never, ever questioning the jury's diligence mm -hmm. or verdict. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't agree with it, but um, jurors have to be thanked for their conduct, and if they think they're going to be publicly ridiculed, they're less likely to come forward. I thought he was very, very professional. And he made the point that they gave careful consideration. Cheryl, the, the other point about it is, is again, the victims and the Jane Doe's who testified, will they testify again? And we talked about it earlier, and I wanted to recap it with you. Investigators were the ones who had first contact with these Jane Doe's and tried to understand what their stories were about. They obviously believed their story so much to then go through the next step in the legal process of getting the prosecution, the prosecutor's office involved. But where do you think maybe there was a disconnect between what a jury believes and ultimately what investigators believe? Well, you know, I think the difference is that investigators are professionals and we're used to dealing with, um, you know, these kinds of victims and their reluctance to, um, number one, want to get involved. And is that going to be an issue going uh, forward with an another trial? You know, will they be able to find those that are homeless if they're transient? And so, you know, some of these victims may just decide, you know what, he's going to get some time. It's not as much as I wanted. And I just don't want to be a part of this anymore very different relationship what investigators have because you have to develop a rapport. You have to um, almost befriend the victims, if you will, to make them feel comfortable with you. And sometimes it's a little bit different than the rapport that you have with uh, a prosecutor, their investigators, and ultimately with the jury. Well, it's all about those Jane Doe's, and we're going to talk more about those Jane Doe's after our next break because when we come back, we'll hear how they were characterized by both sides. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.